What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. Alexander crossed the Hellespont in 334 BC and launched an invasion of the mighty Persian Empire. Soon after, he <coughs> crushed a provincial Achaemenid army at the Battle of the Granicus, leaving all of Asia Minor ripe for conquest. However, before right the Macedonian army taken. could push deeper into Darius's empire and face down its giant armies, it would have to deal with a number of stubborn cities on the Aegean coast loyal to the great king. It was time to... Darius weren't no great king really, was he? ...whether the military machine created by Philip could handle a siege. Join kings and generals in this third episode of our series, covering the sieges of Miletus and Halicarnassus. Halicarnassus. One of the most iconic events in the campaigns of Alexander is his cutting of the Gordian Knot. Let's see what this episode has in store for us then, guys. Okay. Reports of what had occurred at the Granicus reverberated throughout Asia Minor with prodigious speed and to immediate effect. At Ephesus, the mercenary garrison, together with one of Alexander's exiled court rivals, Amnitus, seized a pair of warships and abandoned their post, making their way to the great king's court. So they were fleeing. Marching from Sardis, the victorious Macedonian king captured Ephesus without resistance after a three-day march, before rendezvousing with his navy and receiving emissaries from other Lydian towns, offering submission. Intent on securing his conquest... So, um... You don't want to sound harsh, but Darius III is really an embarrassment to the great Persian king, such as Cyrus the Great and Darius the Great. Um, why so? Why, why do you think so? Just, I don't think he was that great either, but I'm just sort of wondering why. Um, Bruno, you also think that Darius was a mistake. Uh, like saying the siege was covered, was covered in the two... Sorry, the siege was covered in about two seconds in the e Extra History TV's version. So this should be completely new to you. I'm looking forward to seeing how this siege goes then. Because, um, yeah, it would just be interesting to see, like they said, how Philip's army can handle a siege indeed. Yes, before advancing inland, Alexander appointed Parmenian and Alcimachus each a contingent of several thousand troops and sent them off to assure the capitulation of settlements throughout Ionia, Lydia and Aeolia. Mm -hmm. Just trying to bring them into clear. his fold as well. Greek cities were to have democratic governments installed, oligarchies were to be deposed, local customs were to remain unchanged, and crucially, taxes cancelled. A gesture which never hurts a new ruler's popularity. Yes, very interesting changes and implements that they were trying to put into action within the region. At this point, while he was concluding affairs in Ephesus, Alexander received a number of important messages in quick succession. First came welcome reports that the governor of Miletus, Hegesistratus, was mm -hmm. prepared to surrender his city. Then came the definitely less welcome news that a massive Achaemenid war fleet had been spotted near Rhodes on its way to reinforce the area. So Finally, that's a bit of a worry. Later. How much uh, naval force did Alexander have at this point in time? I'm very interested as well. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Like, no taxes, sign me straight up. Alexander got wind that Hegesistratus, newly inspired by the knowledge that reinforcements were en route, had recanted his surrender. Hmm. Realising he had to act swiftly to prevent the city becoming a nigh-impregnable Persian fortress, Alexander sent riders to recall his generals and then immediately marched south with what soldiers he had. Okay. The king's Hellenic League Bringing all the forces about together. 160 ships were sent ahead. Racing along the coast, it succeeded in arriving at Miletus before the incoming enemy fleet was anywhere close, where it set down anchor at the adjacent island of Ladi. Mm -hmm. Not long thereafter, Alexander arrived with the army and occupied Miletus's landward outer suburbs without resistance, before establishing a blockade of the inner districts. Then, to reinforce his anchored fleet at Ladi, 
the king further fortified the island with Thracian skirmishers and a few thousand mercenary okay, soldiers. Okay, nice, very the interesting. The massive Persian fleet finally approached Miletus a full three days after the Greek fleet had made its base at Vladi. Yeah, However, so, they're, so they're well and truly cemented within that position. Can they defend it is the next question. I'm sure, I'm wondering. Uh, I'm sure the tax exemption was temporary. Of course it was only temporary DZ, but we all definitely wanted it, didn't we? Um, for sure. And Zods, because all, all he really had to do was show a small amount of... Ta sorry. Tackle and a bravery, and he could... He could have stopped Alexander as great as Alexander was, he made mistakes. The Darius failed to exploit. That's the reason why he wasn't as great. I struggled to say that whole little sentence there. But I do see what you're saying and I do sort of understand it. If Darius had have took um, the time to exploit the uh, mistakes that Alexander had made, then it could have um, sort of ended up completely differently. Alexander basically abolished the Macedonian Navy. They're, they were terrible sailors to begin with and the upkeep was way too high. If he really needed a navy, he could call upon the Athens, which were expert sailors. That makes sense, and they had the ability to call upon them. Despite a numerical superiority of more than two to one, and the empire's expert Phoenician and Cypriot crews, the Persians realized they would not be able to mm -hmm. dislodge Alexander's navy from Ladi, nor yep. easily deploy troops to bolster Miletus's defense. The 400 Persian ships were therefore forced to circumvent the Hellenic navy and anchor at an exposed suboptimal position of Mount Pekeli further from the city and cut off from any source it's of way fresh too water far by away. parties of Macedonian cavalry. Making the decision to keep his inferior fleet on the defensive at Vladi, Alexander began readying his siege weaponry and infantry to breach the city fortifications. I think that was the smartest thing for Alexander to do though, was just to keep those ships there defending in the way. As the king's the preparations were nearing completion, a prominent citizen came out on behalf of the mercenary garrison to parley. Mm -hmm. According to this messenger, the garrison offered Miletus as an open city, open to both Persians and Alexander alike, if only the siege was lifted. Alexander's unimpressed response was simple. Prepare yourselves for the fight. <laughs> yes, yes, Alexander, yes. No, I can't be asked to deal with your sitting on the fence bullshit. We're taking it. This city's going to be ours. You don't like it, we'll fight for it. Bring it on. The following day, Parmenian and Alcimachus returned, allowing an assault. Macedonian ballistae and catapults began hammering the fortifications, clearing sections of the wall, and inflicting okay. structural damage while battering rams advanced to create breaches up close. The main body of infantry was drawn up as this assault was ongoing, standing ready in preparation to rush in and widen any gap in the militian defences. However, due Come on to the in, Alexander. Of the How are you going to do this? Abundance of missile fire. The initial Macedonian attack was blunted with relative ease. Arian relates how the nearby Persian navy, although unable to resist, were close enough to see Alexander's men advancing against their isolated allies across the bay with the naked eye. But what? As time went on, was there just nowhere? So I thought they had troops on the ships. Were they just not able to sort of dock up on the side there uh, and let the troops come out? Or were they supposed to be sort of used for artillery? What's the uh, point of the Navy being there but not doing anything? On, the land the opposition Navy. gradually began making progress. Small punctures were made, missile stores ran low, and the defenders were placed under ever-increasing pressure. Mm -hmm. All that the Macedonians required was something to tip the scales, and Miletus would be theirs. Seeing that the king had launched his assault from the land, Admiral Nicanor embarked his ships from Ladi and sailed them into the Miletian harbour mouth, tightly packed in an ostensible attempt to prevent any Persian move to relieve the city. Okay, nice. Were they able to, were those areas weakly defended? Were they able to exploit and sort of uh, land troops there? It had a far greater effect than that. There you go, it had a far With greater effect. In which way? Crumbling under Alexander's assault, this quasi-attack prompted a total collapse. 
the Macedonian army subsequently managed to get inside the city, primarily killing soldiers, but also civilians who might have been in the way. Mm. Of the Miletian defenders, just 300 mercenaries and a scattering of other warriors managed to escape to a steep-sided islet slightly offshore. When they surrendered soon after, Alexander granted them the mercy he had learned at the Granicus. The citizens there you go, okay, so he gave a bit of mercy now, which is interesting, just because he knew the cost to not do so was going to be too high. Um, it didn't seem like this siege was too difficult for him either. ...who had survived the brief spate of violence were also left alone. Unable to prevent the fall of the city it had come to reinforce, and successfully prevented from foraging ashore, the still formidable Persian fleet sailed to Samos, restocked with whatever they needed, and then returned to Miletus, mm -hmm. looming in open water close to the harbour entrance. Five Persian vessels were sent as bait to lure Alexander onto the open sea, but a swift hit-and-run assault by ten Greek triremes destroyed one of them and sent the other four running nice. back to the main fleet. And I'm assuming they then didn't sort of uh, chase after them any further. Uh, and just sort of left it as that little skirmish, Able which was a good plan. to accomplish plan. anything of use, the great king's armada weighed anchor and sailed south to Halicarnassus. With Miletus conquered, it was at this moment in mid to late 334 that Alexander made the strategic decision to disband his fleet. Not only would such an unconventional course of action relieve Alexander of having to bear the massive cost required to maintain said ships, but in truth, he did not totally trust their Greek crews. Oh, Moreover, the okay. King was pragmatic enough to so was that what you were talking about, like earlier, when you said that um, the the, uh, the Greek crews were too, too expensive? So at the start, initial parts of the invasion, he did have the Greek navy, but then he decided not to use them and then to sort of uh, rely on the Athens if he needed to. Um, if so, that would be interesting. Indeed, Alexander's late siege of Tyre was his magnum op. Uh, he's basically his better siege warfare. That would be very interesting. Um, as great as Tyre was when it come to sieges, nothing beats Alasia and the goat Julius Caesar himself. I completely agree as well as odds. Realised that he could never hope to match Darius's naval strength on the water mm -hmm. with or without a fleet of his own. Just 20 Athenian triremes were retained to ferry the army's siege engines. Based on his army's pitched battle at the Granicus... So he kept some ships to um, transport the siege weapons, which was very interesting. And I assume that it's also going to help with supply runs, but they're not necessarily used for warfare. And siege at Miletus... Alexander judged that investing everything in a land campaign was his best shot at success. Okay. His army was master of the continent, and now there was no way to retreat, its troops would fight on even harder. Mm, very interesting. Also, getting rid of the navy makes it less difficult for him to get back. I didn't think about that either. That's a good point. Okay. Still, Persian seaborne might was a firm threat that had to be dealt with, or it might expand the war to a second front in Greece, or even inspire rebellions at home. Okay. So, rather than attempting to oppose Achaemenid naval hegemony in the eastern Mediterranean by vainly headbutting it with ships of his own, Alexander instead devised a plan to conquer the ships from the land. He would embark on a Herculean endeavour within his already titanic campaign marching inexorably down the Mediterranean coastline and capturing coastal cities the from which the Persian navy I operated. See. The first I victim see. of Alexander's new strategy would be Halicarnassus, where Mausolus's eponymous... Hence why we get... And this is why we sort of get to understand the route he took, because he wanted to basically take out as much of the naval threat as possible. Very smart as by Mausoleum Alexander there. Mausoleum was constructed a few decades earlier. Set in a natural amphitheatre, Halicarnassus was heavily fortified, possessed a fantastic harbour, and had its garrison swollen by native troops, alongside several thousand mercenaries mm -hmm. under Memnon of Rhodes's command. This Greek general, who had risen to new heights following the Granicus debacle, was now Darius's official commander of Achaemenid efforts in the western satrapies. I remember that. Well, 
Sorry, uh, just quickly there. I remember that Memon sent his wife and children to the Great King at this point as good safe. I remember that um, information from the Epic History TV uh, video as well. Commander of Achaemenid efforts in the Western Satrapies. En route to this showdown with Memnon, Alexander stopped at the greatest fortress in the region, Alinda, mm -hmm. and was introduced to the exiled Princess Ada, Mausolus's sister. Until just a few years before the Macedonian invasion, this region of southwestern Asia Minor, known as Caria, had been ruled by a native dynasty known as the Hecatomnids, who were in turn autonomous satraps within the Persian Empire. Ada, a Hecat. What does satraps mean? Someone let me know what satrap means. Hecatomnid princess had been. Is it like independent? ruler well not independent but it is someone who sort of has independency within the region but pays taxes or some kind of um exchange for that to another party who's higher than them um and but but that person like so the, the persian king doesn't doesn't necessarily get to dictate the laws within the land the just satraps need to pay the persian king is that what a satrap is the rightful heir before being deposed and exiled by her brother Pixadarus in 340. Mm -hmm. He died a few years later, allowing the Persians to marry the late Dynast's daughter to Orontabetes and install him as satrap. Mm, now Adar okay. asked the king for aid in taking back her rightful position. By accepting this plea, Diodorus Siculus tells us that Alexander won allegiance from many of the Carian cities. So he's getting more populous within that region on his side and getting more popu popularity, which honestly can win wars within itself, um, having the sort of cities on your side. Satrap is Eastern term for a governor, basically. Perfect. Okay. Just a governor. So they're still, they still work within the complete laws of the Persian uh, company. It's just some kind of governor. Someone appointed to look after that region. Thank you very much for sort of keeping me updated. Alexander is definitely... Sorry, Alexander and the Greeks never really got on, which is completely fair. I remember um, that being sort of pointed out in the ep Epic History TV's version. Uh, of the series. Alexander's naval strategy consisted of capturing Persian naval bases to choke the Persian navy. Yep, I sort of got that as well, Light. Um, Alexander is definitely Greek and don't let any Macedonian or Balkan nationalist tell you otherwise. I also agree, he is definitely uh, Greek indeed. Um, you can't micromanage such a huge state like Persia after all. Uh, it's not like they had any kind of instant communication. I do agree like that um, gov governors were so important back then. The king subsequently moved on Halicarnassus and approached the city, guarded as it was by crenellated walls and fronted by a large encircling moat from the northeast. Mm. Alexander encamped half a mile from the eastern Milasa gate is... and began preparing. That's a nice little defense there with the castle wall and the river. The siege. However, Persian naval supremacy had succeeded in preventing the Macedonian mm -hmm. siege train from landing, so Alexander was forced to improvise until it managed to do so. Mounting his steed, Alexander led a scouting party forward to have a look at the formidable defence. Ah, so the Persian navy have stopped Alexander's boats from getting there, so he has no siege warfare or supplies at the moment. Um, the siege warfare is very important because obviously they're trying to perform a siege here. They faced. Memnon was on him in an instant. When this scouting force approached, the Greek general had his archers and artillery fire upon the Macedonians from his walls. Then, not giving the invaders a second, he led a sortie of skirmishers out to niggle at Alexander's mm -hmm. men with javelins and other missiles. A quick counterattack by the king managed to drive them back inside Halicarnassus, but Alexander nevertheless pulled back to camp. Yeah, it was just. That was really testing the resolves of both sides, really, Several wasn't it? Several days after this initial probe, Alexander assembled his usual crack force of companions, Hypaspists and Agrianes, mm -hmm. supplemented them with three phalanx regiments, and led them around to the western gate. While his primary aim in this endeavour was to scout out this side of Halicarnassus, 
there had also been whisperings from sympathizers inside the nearby port, Mindus, that the city would be surrendered if Alexander came to take it that night. Its possession really? would make seizing Halicarnassus that much easier. Interesting. Under the cover of darkness, Alexander's forces approached Mindus at midnight and waited, and waited, and waited some more. There was no sign of the surrender that the Macedonians had been promised. He would, I bet Alexander was just hoping. He was praying it was going to be that easy, but unfortunately it wasn't. Unwilling or unable to abandon the gambit entirely, Alexander began sapping the walls in an effort to take the town by force. Okay, One that means digging underneath, right? Fell with relative speed, but the prepared garrison fiercely resisted until reinforcements arrived from mm. Alexander's by sea. Having been prepared to simply walk into Mundus, Alexander wasn't ready for another extended siege and so withdrew to the Melassa Gate, rejoining the bulk of his army. In what was a yeah, it was too much of a risk, uh, sort of trying to go any further with that plan without any more reinforcements on his side, wasn't it? Uh, for sure. Um, at least the defenders know how to use a strong fortress, unlike Game of Thrones. <laughs> Truly fortunate twist of fate, 20 Athenian triremes bearing Alexander's siege train managed to evade Memnon's ships and unload the city-taking weaponry in a nearby cove. After okay, so Alexander's start, boats have got there. Last looking up for the Macedonians. Mm -hmm. They're getting their siege we weapons. As the siege engines were made ready, Alexander sent his soldiers, under the cover of portable roofed sheds, to fill in large sections of the outer trench with earth and stones. Mm -hmm. With the ground prepared, the first proper assault on Halicarnassus could begin in earnest. While trundling siege towers and artillery were used to batter the fortifications, Battering rams and mining operations gradually undermined sections of the East Curtain Wall. Nice, nice. When the Macedonian undermining efforts managed to collapse a section of wall or bring down a tower, Alexander would throw his infantry at the section in an attempt to secure a breach. The Macedonian soldiery fought exceptionally well in these engagements, as they always did. Mate, look at that. Look at that right there, with all those phalanxes just sort of having their spears poked out of that hole. Crazy. It's like a giant porcupine. You wouldn't want to go anywhere near it. It's wood, but Memnon's equally disciplined Greek mercenaries, supplemented by thousands of native troops and wall archers, managed to keep the invaders at bay with relative ease. So far, so good, but Memnon and his command council quickly understood that their enemy's efforts were destroying the walls with disconcerting efficiency. I see. So they, they knew they were in a sticky situation. A proactive stance had to be made to prevent disaster. So that same night, while builders worked to patch up the previous day's damage with makeshift secondary fortifications, a commando unit of Halicarnassus' defenders, under Memnon, slipped out of the Carian capital unnoticed and quietly approached the dormant Macedonian siege machines. Oh, nice. So Memnon's going to basically try and, uh, through the night, uh, basically destroy or um, damage these siege weapons the best they can. Very smart. Thus, the Greek general attempted to burn down and destroy Alexander's towers, rams and artillery pieces. Unfortunately for his raiding party, its presence was discovered by sentinels who quickly mm -hmm. sounded the alarm. Macedonian reinforcements converged and a blind, desperate clash in the dark ensued. Beleaguered, unsuccessful and having lost 170 nice. men killed, Achaemenid forces were eventually forced into retreat. Nice, that's but good for Alexander. The time struggle had also resulted in 300 Macedonian wounded. Having suffered such casualties, mate, this is a this is one mighty siege. This one. Neither side made a move for several days and were temporarily content to lick their wounds. This state of affairs apparently changed three days later at the behest of two rowdy Macedonian infantrymen from Perdiccas's regiment. Mm -hmm. In the process of drinking together, each man boasted of his exploits and declared how brave they were. <laughs> Amusingly, and almost certainly because of Dutch courage, the contest escalated into the two enterprising warriors taking up their weapons and moving out, intent on putting words into action. Ah, <laughs> oh, honestly, that is just two geezers who just can't deal with being, like, 
can't deal with the other person being better than them. So they just ha uh, they just have to have a. I've got a bigger dick. It's about bigger dick and who's got a bigger dick measuring in it. Do you know what I mean? Like they just. Yeah, yeah. They can't deal with anything stupid. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. They can't deal with being inferior to another person. So they've got to prove that they're the better person. Perhaps somewhat bemused by the odd attack, some guards saw the Macedonians coming and sallied out to mm -hmm. assail them, but were in turn killed and driven back by... Oh, the they're doing well though. Go on, boys. Made aware that some of their comrades were in danger, more men from Perdiccas's regiment marched no to the fight, way. drawing even more defenders. This haphazard engagement grew and grew until the Macedonians eventually drove the defenders against the half-destroyed Melassa section of the wall. Mm. Suddenly, with the eastern fortifications in such a bad state, it seemed as though Alexander's forces might actually get into the city on the back of this deadly drunken brawl. This is jokes. Is Alexander going to take advantage of this? Unfortunately for the troops who started the whole debacle, Halicarnassus's surprise was matched by most of the Macedonian mm. army, which, being unaware of what was actually happening, did not press the attack in time, and Perdiccas's men were repelled. Ah, okay. Alexander's late intervention prevented their destruction. Mm. To protect the area, Memnon had a crescent brick wall built, but this slapdash measure was clearly a weakness. Yeah, what a shame. What a shame. But it, so it provided more time for Memon to be able to make defences within the um, areas that Alexander had already made weak. Still. Memon of Rhodes was probably Alexander's most dangerous adversary, but his death early on in Alexander's campaign put a stop to that. Interesting, like, I wonder why. The nature of this event disguises the fact that it was a Does he die here then? that claimed the lives of many on both sides. So many Macedonians were killed, in fact, that Alexander sent a herald forward to ask for a truce so bodies might be recovered. Two he lost that many men. Comrades, Ephialtes and Thrasybulus, advised their leader to deny this request. Memnon, in a move which allows us to see some of the man's honourable character, allowed it anyway. Nice, score, no Memnon. No real timescale is given by which we can judge the siege for sure, but the defenders had managed to hold the city for at least several weeks. However, if matters continued as they were, the Achaemenid generals believed that Halicarnassus would fall. In a final gambit that must have made Alexander blush even as it made him bleed, Memnon sent 2,000 men under Ephialti through the Melassa Gate during one of the Macedonian attacks. While half formed a phalanx and doggedly held off the king's infantry, the other half wielded brands and caused a great conflagration among his siege engines. Interesting. Ephialtes' surprise attack, ably assisted by missile fire from the walls, was pushing back Alexander's infantry. The Literally, so the uh, academic... Uh men here just realize that they have to make a last stand is that right because uh, otherwise they're just gonna lose this siege because of um uh because of resources they're gonna lack lack food lack water so on and so forth um yeah the dog always wants some attention dz <laughs> The situation became even more critical when Memnon sallied out of the northern gate of the city with Persian reserves, striking the Macedonian infantry in the flanks and rear. At this moment, beset on all sides, Theodorus states that even Alexander found himself quite helpless. Mm, it seemed as literally, he's starting to struggle here. The Persians were close to achieving a great victory and breaking the siege. What's Alexander doing? However, it was at this final juncture that Alexander's reserve battalion of grizzled veterans from Philip's mm. era, who were ostensibly exempt from combat. So they, so why were they exempt? They were basically that strong, and they were the very, very last stand, sort of like. Um, Napoleon's was it his young guard or it wasn't his young guard it was it his elite guard again Napoleon's sort of elite men that were only to be used at the very very last opportunity is that sort of similar here 
Um, just going to read this little side note as well. Silver Shields during the campaign in India fought on the flanks, but unlike other Hispanians, was able to storm the walls and perform other strategic tasks as well. Very Enough interesting. So they're very useful units. Era, who were ostensibly exempt from combat, locked their shields, lowered their spears, and entered the fray. Mm -hmm. These elders smashed directly into Ephialtes' spent ranks, an unbreakable nice. shield wall, and ripped them to pieces. Mm. Then going on to the other side. Guard of warriors, the Macedonian soldiers rallied and pressed the assault. Nice. In minutes following this intervention, the Greek captain Ephialtes and hundreds of his soldiers were slain. That's it, started to crumble. Worse still was the psychological effect. The defenders had been on the edge of victory, perhaps of winning the entire war. They were not prepared for another fresh foe, and now they began routing. Mm. So panicked were the Imagine thinking you were so close to victory for it all to come crumbling down. The at this sudden turn of events that they closed the gates too hastily. Trapping and men were outside. outside to be slaughtered against oh, the ruined curtain no. wall. Over 1,000 of Memnon's troops had been slain in the risky action, and it hadn't paid off. Still, Alexander, whose cause had been definitively saved by the veteran corps, cautiously pulled back to camp at nightfall. Un Once again, so I think Alexander knows here that uh, they've lost a lot of men, a lot of willpower. Um, is it necessarily worth going in for the full... Um, the full raid of the, uh, of the city or so hopefully they'll sort of lose morale and they'll surrender when it sort of turns dawn I'm assuming that's where he sort of uh, got his head at indeed and it was Napoleon's old guard but it was very similar I am correct in the thinking that they were very similar weren't they uh, they were an elite but honorary guard unit basically yeah known to him the siege was over and he had won mm -hmm. inside the moonlit city Memnon and Arontabates took counsel, and taking into account all of their severe losses and the failure of their final gamble, decided to give up a greater part of the city. Memnon installed the best of his remaining soldiers in Halicarnassus's seaboard citadels at Salmachis and the Arcanesi, before loading the remainder onto his anchored mm. and unchallenged navy, together with whatever movable supplies he could get his hands on. Then, in a methodical scorched earth attempt to prevent Alexander from gaining too much from his conquest, the withdrawing Achaemenids set fire nice. to the movable stores, armories, Small. artillery, and houses next to the walls. It did not seem to have been a vindictive act of wanton destruction against the civilian population, but seasonal autumn winds fanned the flames and led to its spread over great areas of the ancient city. Mm, I see. So they originally only targeted store uh, store grains for, for food, uh, armories, things like that, but due to, to winds and the uh, combustion... Um, the combustion ability? No, that, that is not a word at all. What did I attempt to say there, guys? Uh, due to the fact that all the houses were so compostable, uh, that fire was easily spread, uh, it seems. While Memnon raised anchor and embarked, Alexander finally entered the burning city at midnight. At the king's command, Macedonian regiments marched respectfully through mm -hmm. the liberated city, rescuing any inhabitant imperiled by the fire and demolishing buildings to create fire bricks. Surveying the still garrisoned fortresses, Alexander had a wall built around Salmachis to prevent any sortie, but found himself okay. unable to do anything about the island strong point of Akinesi, mm. leaving 3,000 mercenaries and 200 cavalry to mop up on Persian resistance in Caria. Alexander kept his promise and gave Ada the satrapy before preparing to move deeper nice. into Asia Minor. Okay, okay. As he did so, the armies of Great King Darius the Third were finally nearing readiness to the mm. east. In the These were only garrison units. They weren't the full army of, Cari uh, of Carius, of Darius, the great king. So we still got all of that to look forward to in future Course episodes. Of the next year, 333, they would march west to the first great confrontation mm -hmm. between the two greatest kings of the age at Isis. Our video on that epic battle is on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it.
and I am definitely looking forward to finding out what that great battle is going to be in the next episode. What a great reaction once again. I thoroughly